Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, brief presentation on Open Wide Our Hearts, uh, the U.S. Bishop's Pastoral on Racism that came out in 2018. My name is Andrew Musgrave, and I'm the director of the Catholic Social Action Office for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. I'm Deacon Royce Winters. I'm the director of African American Ministries for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. It is wonderful to, to have this time before you to address the issue of racism. So today, we're going to just very briefly talk about Catholic social teaching, because that's what grounds uh, the work that we do in the issue of racism. Have a couple of definitions around the word racism, because words matter, and making sure we're coming from the same place about the issue of racism. Very briefly look at how the church has addressed racism over the last uh, 70 plus years, and then delve in again a bit more deeply into the document Open Wide Our Hearts. So Catholic social teaching, uh, this is the heart of what the church says about our interaction with the world, how we go about the world, how we understand the importance, the dignity of all people. Uh, we're not gonna get into this, but I assume all of you are familiar with these. If not, pause this video, go look them up and dig into them, but understand that the root of Catholic social teaching is that every single person, every person, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are, the color of their skin, their race, their religion, their creed, their ethnicity, they all have dignity. It comes from God. You can't take it away. And we have a responsibility to care for it. And all these other statements about our commitment to family, our rights and our responsibilities, caring for the poor, solidarity, caring for the earth. These are all manifestations of how we love each other, how we respect the dignity of all people, and how we work to make sure that all people enjoy the blessings that God has in store for all of us. Now, there are a lot of different definitions for racism, a lot of ways that people think about racism, and we're going to give you how we think about racism so that you can understand where we're coming from as we're talking. Racism for us is a simple combination of power plus prejudice. Now, prejudice, generally speaking, is thought of as a bad thing, but certainly some of us have prejudices that keep us safe. If, you saw a bear walking down the street, you might prejudge that bear is going to hurt you, so you get out of the way and get away from it. But when you add power to your prejudice, then you get to the issue of racism. Very simply put, we all have prejudices. We all have biases towards people, towards things, towards groups. But if I have a prejudice towards a group of people, if I don't like all people from Croatia for some reason, I can't really do anything about it, about that. I can say I don't like them. If I meet somebody from Croatia, I can say I don't like you, but I can't, I have no capacity to make that a reality or to affect people from Croatia. But if you have a prejudice and there is power behind that, if an institution, if a government can enforce that, can create policies and laws that make that prejudice part of culture, then you have power, then you have racism. And that's what we're talking about today is, is when you have a prejudice towards a racial group and you have the power to make that the law of the land, to, to make that the way that the culture works. Racism, you end up with these racist ideas that inform racist policies that create racial inequity. What's also important about racism, and this is a difficult term for people to think about, but it's important is the idea of white privilege. To me, to us, you cannot have racism without having white privilege. Now, that doesn't mean that white people are seeking to have power, that white people want to have something over others. But what it does mean, racism is a removal of or a, a lack of recognition of power for someone. And if that is taken away from someone, it must necessarily go somewhere else. So white privilege is the idea that white people are able to enjoy the benefits of a racist system. They're able to enjoy power and enjoy privilege because others are being denied that, that privilege, denied that place, denied that recognition of who they are. So when we talk about white privilege and we must talk about it, it isn't to say that white people have sought to have this, that, that they want to be more than or have more than another race, but it is the necessary flip side of having racist uh, attitudes in a racist system. 
And the other important uh, note about racism is that racism is not simply a matter of individual actions. Again, going back to that definition of power pro plus prejudice, when your prejudice comes to be cultural and, and there is power behind that prejudice, it creates systems that perpetuate that prejudice. And that's where you end up with not only individual acts, but then institutional and systematic racism. You end up with government institutions, you end up with corporate institutions that make the racism a, a part of how things work in the world. And it contributes towards systems. It, ends, it contributes towards the reality of, for example, the educational system, the healthcare system, the criminal justice system, being racist because of the the prejudice that exists and the power structure that props them up and allows them to operate the way they do uh, in, in deference to one group and at the expense of another group. The US Catholic bishops have been addressing uh, racism uh, in the United States church officially since 1943. And there are, there are several documents that we're gonna touch and the first one is 1943, where the bishops state, we owe these citizens their rights. Well, we have to figure out what citizens are they talking about? That in order to owe some, somebody something, that means you denied them something. So what the bishops are, are acknowledging that Black folk, African-Americans of that day, were systematically denied justice in America and access to those things that lead toward dignity of life, uh, quality of life. There was an inequity of, of, of what people were had access to. And then in 1958, they, race is not a cause for discrimination. It, it, it says in, in some strange way, the bishop wrote, all must act quietly, courageously, and, be, and prayerfully before it's too late. I want to know how can we act courageously and be quiet? It's, it's, it's not possible. There, it is. We, we, can, we can always pray, and we know that we believe that God inclines his ear to, to, to hear us. But prayer without action is not prayer. That we're, we're, We pray so that God may give us the courageous intent to address the ills of our society. And the bishops go, go on to say later in 1968, where they begin to first use the language of racism. If, if we can look back in history and see what was going on in America, you know, that, that, that we had the, uh, the, the civil rights uprising and, 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 and that the bishops were trying to address that in an official way. They, 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 they then used this word racism and not only for the individual, but, but, but also for institutions and the church is an institution. So not only do we address that outside of the church, but we address that in the church as well. So then 1979, they then write a document which, which talks about the economic implications of racism as a sin and social sin. When, you know, when we, we say we're gonna give people access, we also have to address the systems that, 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 that keep them in poverty. And, and, and the bishops began to, to take a look at this and realize that the tentacles of the church to address poverty, to address racism, to address the inequities in our society, that it needed to be much broader than, than what they had, had begun to talk about. And then in 1984, the, we had 10 African-American bishops at the time who then a, a quote that, that, that we'll use is, to preach to the powerful without denouncing oppression is to promise Easter without Calvary, forgiveness without conversion, and healing without cleansing the wound. It's one thing to name it, but then not to address it is, is, is a sin as well. We, you know, in the church, in our confeder, we, we talk about the sins that we've committed and the sin, and the things that we have failed to do. And that's just what the bishops are, are, are talking about. It's one thing to have conceptually, have a conversation about what, what, what we must do. But then if we don't act, if we fail to act, if we fail to do, then it's a sin as well, that we have a responsibility to address the ills of our society so that we can, truly say to people credibly that we believe that all life is sacred. And we have uh, Bishop Braxton, who is one of the, the foremost authorities, at least of addressing racism in the Catholic Church. He has written several books and he has written often and uh, about racial justice in the church, right? 
and, and he's coming from this perspective of being a black bishop, but also being what we call the, one of the princes of the church as, as bishops to, to, to call people and attention to that we must address this. We, we, we don't have a choice that in order to, to stand that, that we're all created equal and, and, and all lives are, 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 are dignity, have the, should know the dignity of life then we have to address the ills of society that keep people in those situations where they cannot see themselves in the dignity that, that God has given us. He, he's recently written a new book entitled The Church and the Racial Divide. Also recently in, in the couches in the broader church, uh, back in 2015, the Pope in his uh, World Day of Peace message um, titled it The Racial Divide in the U.S., and he spoke in the context of several of the uh, young Black men who had been killed and Black women who had been killed and talked about how this divided us as a country and how he saw this and knew this was something that we as a church needed to address for us to heal and to be prophetic and to be God's kingdom on earth. In 2016, the church put out a statement addressing Black Lives Matter. And, and it's important, I think, for us to bring this up because there has been uh, challenges around this phrase and how and if we can't use it. The statement from the, bit, the bishops say that the true intent of Black Lives Matter is a plea to all Americans to work to refashion our country. The lives of people of color do matter, actually do matter as much as the lives of white people. So it isn't to say that Black Lives Matter, but others don't. It is to recognize the fact that Black lives have not mattered, that they have not been given the same value, the same, the same weight, the same dignity as other lives, and we must work to address that. And it also goes on, and I think this is really also important and, and astute of them to recognize that as they've talked about racism, that African Americans were not, have not been generally part of the conversation. The documents have been created and promulgated by the church, but largely without the input of black clergy, black Catholics. And that's something that needs to be addressed and needs to be uh, rectified as we move forward. Bishop Bob, who is the uh, chair of the uh, USCCB Ad Hoc Committee on Racism just spoke here uh, to our priest at the convocation uh, on Wednesday, April 20th, 21st. And in his statement, he actually addressed this. And again, because he spoke it here and because this is a, a challenging topic, it's worth uh, repeating this. He said, I believe it is possible to support the sentiment expressed by the phrase Black Lives Matter without supporting an organization of the same name which promotes and fosters things contrary to the teachings of the church. And, and this is where we have to be discerning in how we speak, and we have to be faithful in our commitment to this uh, sin and to addressing this sin and to justice. For us to somehow out of hand deny the importance of this phrase simply because one group who espouses views that do not line up with church teaching uh, and, and therefore to deny that phrase its, its power and to not acknowledge its importance is, 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 is faulty. It, it is not faithful to who we are. And so we say that we believe that Black Lives Matter and that the movement is important, even though we don't acknowledge that particular organization. One other bishop, uh, Bishop Seitz out of El Paso, uh, addressed this. I think this is in 2018, I could be wrong on this, but he also pointed this out that Black Lives Matter is just another way of repeating something that we in the U.S. seem to have so often forgotten, that God has a special love for the God, forgotten and the oppressed. Again, not that Black Lives Matter more, but that Black Lives Matter as well, and they have not been honored. And then just to build and to mention a few other bishops who have spoken well on this statement. Uh, Bishop Copley out of Oklahoma City, as mentioned, we've talked about how uh, the bishops have talked about uh, racism as a sin. And he goes on to say, he goes on more specifically to say, this deadly treatment of black people is antithetical to the gospel of life. 
And therefore, we as bishops unequivocally state that racism is a life issue. It is on par with other life issues because it assaults the dignity and the life of people. Bishop Barber out of Oakland also uh, references, it goes into and, and references the, the pastoral letter, Open Wide Our Hearts, and talks about the fact that because of these racist acts violating justice, because they are the cumulative act of our personal action, we are all accomplices in racism, and therefore it requires a conversion of each of our minds and our hearts if we're going to end this, if we're going to combat this. And this leads us into our conversation about Open Wide Our Hearts. So in context, the U.S. bishops have been writing about racism, addressing racism since 1943. We find that in November of 2018, the U.S. bishops promulgate a pastoral letter entitled Open Wide Our Hearts. And it is from that that the bishops acknowledge that the church has a role to bind up the wounds of society that, and through the evil that is racism. That in 2018, think about what's going on in our world in 2018 and still till today, that the evil of racism, the sin of racism has raised its head once again, and, and that the church finds itself on the precipice of what are we going to do? Are we, are we going to be true to who we say we are, that all lives are valuable, that all lives are have been created in the image of God, then if that's so, then we must be standing with those who are fighting for justice and the, the end of racism in America. So the, so the bishops write, as bishops of the Catholic Church in the, in the United States, we want to address one particularly destructive and persistent form of evil. Despite many promising strides made in our country, racism still affects our nation. And what a great statement by the bishops to then come forth to acknowledge that we've been at this a while and that we must act, right? That we've been doing this a while. It is not only something of our past, but it's something of our present and it continues in our future. And we must do something to eradicate this evil. But then as they write this document and they're writing in time, the bishops allow us to peer into their collective psyche for they say we have never sufficiently contended with the impact of overt racism, nor have we spent the time necessary to examine where the racist attitudes of yesterday have become a permanent part of our perceptions, practices, and policies of today or how they have been enshrined in our social, political, and economic structures. Now, as the bishops write, they're writing as the leaders of this U.S. church. And, and they're saying, even though they have recognized the, the, the impact of the sin of racism in the church upon its people, that they have failed to act. And in this document, they, they say we should all act together, that we can no longer um, be blind even though we name it and yet not act, we can no longer do that. And, it's, and, and, and I think that's a promising step for us to where we are today. So the bishops go on to write that racism arises when a person holds that his or her own ethnicity is superior. Racist acts are sinful because they violate justice. You know, one of the things that the bishop states is that most races will never acknowledge that they are racist, right? It is a, a how we look at ourselves and sometimes not be honest. But most of us who are living today, we have to be honest that we haven't done our part of, of addressing this evil. Some of us have even failed to recognize the evil. Some of us have even denied the evil. But as a collective body of, of believers, those of us who follow the wonderful example of, of Jesus is that we, we know that those who stand before us those who look like us, those who look different than us, those who speak different languages, they, they, they are us. We are in this together. We are the people of God and we do this together, so we must act. The bishops go on to say racism can often be found in our hearts. Found in our hearts. That's a, that, that's, that's, and sometimes it's conscious, as we're talking about, sometimes it's unconscious, but it's there. And we have to acknowledge that 
sometimes this attitude of superiority, right, can be seen in how certain groups of people are vilified, called criminals, or is perceived as being unable to contribute to, con to society and even unworthy of its benefits. That is, we look back in the history of America, we've thrown away so many people, right? People of color, people who are poor, people who are homeless. We, 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 we have this knack in us to push people to the margins. And the bishops are, are, are saying we must acknowledge our role in denying the dignity of life for other people. But they, but they say something that's so strange, it, it, it continues to strike me and, 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 and hurts my heart. For they say, too many good and faithful Catholics remain unaware of the connection between institutional racism and the continued erosion of the sanctity of life. We understand that the, ch that the church challenged us to form our hearts and minds. We, we must be knowledgeable. We must seek a transformation and conversion that happens through a reflection of what's going on in the world, what's going on in the church, but what's going on in us, we're asking God to remove from us that which is evil, that which is faulty, right? And I want you to even think about how anybody as a Catholic could say that too many good and faithful Catholics remain unaware. How can that be possible, right? And then use the phrase good, too many good and faithful Catholics. You know, that, that, as, that, that as good and faithful Catholics is beyond just going to church on a regular basis, sitting in a pew, sharing our talent, our treasure, our gifts, being charitable, right? Being a good Catholic is living out faith in the world and, 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 and raising up the dignity of life for all people. So we have much more to do and the bishops along with us have much more to do. The bishops don't spend a lot of time on this, but they do reference uh, and I think it's important that they do reference the historical context that we are in and what history means. Um, we, we, we are too ignorant of our history and we are too unaware of what our history uh, could teach us if we would delve into it. And the history that we think about, the history that we are taught, we talk about uh, American exceptionalism and, and the good that we've done in the world, and that is all true. But we've also stepped on people. We have forgotten people. We have we have killed people uh, to get to where we are. And we have to acknowledge that and understand what that does to people. These generational effects that exist because of slavery, because of segregation, because of the systematic use of violence against Black people, against Native peoples, against uh, Asian American uh, people, against Hispanic folks. We have used violence and we have oppressed people for, for the entire history of our country. One notable thing that a lot of people don't know about it and that they do reference is the, 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 the systematic terrorism that existed in our country in the form of lynching. As best as we know, something over 4,000 black men, women, and children across 800 counties across these, our United States, over the course of about 75 years were lynched. And we must, they say, acknowledge these realities must be fully recognized and addressed in any process that hopes to combat racism. And for those who, who might deny this, who might not acknowledge uh, what this means, imagine that you are a black person and you know that in this country where you live, that there were public auctions where you could go and buy and sell their ancestors. Imagine knowing that your ancestors, your people were sold like cattle and were sold to be worked literally to death. Or how would you feel if you knew that less than a hundred years ago in our country, people lined the streets to prevent equality measures from passing, that people employed their children to be a part of keeping us apart, of, of segregating and oppressing people having your daughter stand on the street and say, we want to keep our school white. Or imagine knowing that people gathered in city and town squares, brought lunches, brought their children to watch people be lynched, to have them tortured and then killed as a public spectacle and as something that was part of life in your county. 
Imagine the effect that that has on people today. And if we don't acknowledge it, what kind of success, what kind of progress can we make? If you can imagine it, I can. My uh, mother was one of 19 children. Her parents were sharecroppers, meaning they were working the fields, cotton fields, corn fields, and their grandparents were slaves. It is part of my life. It's always been a part of my life. And I can imagine the pain, the terror that was brought on by people who thought they were superior, right? And the evil of racism festers in part because as a nation, there has been very limited not acknowledgement of the harm done to so many. No moment of atonement, no national process of reconciliation, and all too often a neglect of our history. Right? Sometimes we just want to move on. Sometimes we want to sweep it under the rug. Sometimes we is just too hard to bear and we fail to do it. But we all know in that great sacrament of reconciliation is that we in order to, to feel the freedom of being forgiven, we have to acknowledge our sin. And it's collective, right? People say, well, yeah, I wasn't there when slavery happened. No, you weren't, but you are part of a, a system. You are, you are part of America where it did happen. And every day of our lives, we should ask for forgiveness. It's the same thing that we ask of our bishops who in dealing with the sexual abuse in our church, every day of their lives, they should be asking for forgiveness for the things that they've done and the thing, things they failed to do in protecting our children. So it is something that we must do. Again, the bishops and the pastoral letter begin with this idea that what we need is a conversion of heart, a conversion of heart that will compel change and reform our institutions and our society. You know, to as for our society and our institutions to reform, it means that we have to be transformed. It begins with us. Each one of us need to, uh, to approach this opportunity that God has placed in front of us to address who are we and what do we want to be? Do we want to be credible witness of our day whereas we approach Pentecost that the spirit breathes into us the courage to stand, to take a stand and build an America that that we can be proud of, that we can hand down to our children and children's children who can enjoy the freedoms and liberty that, that, that America affords us. And, and one part of that previous slide that I think is really important also is that it took us 400 plus years to get here. We are not quickly going to solve this and heal from this. And so it says it is a long road to travel for the individual, let alone for the institutions and the systems that exist. So we have to understand that it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. And if it was easy, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now, 400 years later. So we know that it's not going to be easy, but in Christ, we have the strength and grace to move forward. If we have this conversion, if we are transformed, then it means that we find through God the love in our hearts to love not only those who are proximate to us, not only those who are in our families or in our neighborhoods or in our church, but to love all, to love everyone, and then to get proximate to those who we are not close to, who we do not know, encounter them, and to love them as well. And then with this love, which is an extraordinary force, it can lead people to opt for courageous and generous engagement in the field of justice and peace. As Pope Paul VI said, if you want peace, we must work for justice. There can be no peace without justice. We cannot move forward into God's kingdom if we have not rightly and appropriately and justly addressed what is, what is the sins of our past and what that means for our, for our world now and our community now. And, and, and I think this is important also to recognize that they talk about what justice is. That not only are we transformed by God, but, but justice is where we go and we are in right relationship with God. 
that we are in relationship with God and by being in right relationship with God, because our God is a relational God, we are also in right relationship with each other and with all of God's creation. So that justice is a gift that is given to us by God and we must we must embrace that gift. We must live that gift. We must be a people of justice and we are going to be credible signs of Christ in our world. And if we're going to be just, it means we must be a society that recognizes and respect the rights of all individuals and peoples. Because again, bringing this back to that idea in Catholic social teaching, we believe that each and every person is created by God with dignity, a dignity that can never be taken away and that must be respected in all situations, in all times, and especially for all those whose dignity has not been heard or respected. We've had this conversation and we invite you to join us in the conversation. And hopefully what we will all come to is that we all have a responsibility to act. We all have a responsibility to address and correct the injustices of racism and healing the harm that it has caused. We must do this. Again, as, as, as Andrew just, just talked about and the bishops have spoken, is, is that, that to not address it says so much about us, but it's, it says so much about us that we're not willing to correct our past, to address the sins of our past, so that we can, again, live in a freedom that, 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 that we all recognize the face of God and, and the person, the, the people, and the situation that we stand in, that we live in, that we play in, that we work in. We must do this together, and we can do it together. Mr. Farb, in addressing the convocation for priests here in Cincinnati in, in, in last week, he encouraged us, which comes from the letter of the pastoral letter from the Archbishop, that those who preach, bishops, priests, deacons, we must do it regularly and direct and, and address the issue of racism and its impact on our homes, our families, and our neighborhood, particularly on certain feast days and national holidays. He said, we direct our, the bishops say, we direct our priests and deacons to do the same. So it says that here we are, they are as bishops, and they've taken in their collective thought that, that they must use their prophetic voices to address this evil, this sin called racism. And then as teachers of the church, they then say, we share this responsibility with the presbyters, those who have been ordained, priests and deacons, and those who preach, is to address this to our community so that our communities can wrestle with us, can grow with us, can transform with us so that we can know who we are as God's holy people. That most of us have not heard in our own parishes, our pastors, our bishops address the issue of racism, the issue, the, the issue that the evil of racism and how we get there. Nor do most of them feel comfortable addressing the issue and they, they they, they, they tend to hide behind an organization or organizations who then do not align with Catholic values. But we have a responsibility to address the evils of society. It is what we call a prophetic voice that as pastors, as priests, as bishops, and as deacons, we must do our part to address the evil that is racism. You're part of us being the holy people of God and we are co-creators of God, that we participate with God in creating a better society. We have a responsibility to build up the kingdom here and now, not tomorrow, but today, that we are workers in the vineyard and, and we're all in the vineyard, that each one of us have this responsibility to do our part. And we must root out those things that are evil, which divide us from God, that separates us from God. Or it sounds like church talk is that, and, and it's a reality that, that, that we know that when we sin, we separate ourselves from God and God is waiting for us. As we heard last week, the good shepherd to, to, to carry us home, to protect us, to guide us. And we say, order our steps, oh Lord, order our steps. So we must be advocates of justice. We don't have that choice. 
But in order to be advocates, we must be knowledgeable. We must be willing to be courageous to address the systems and the attitudes in our own lives that keep people in poverty, people away from justice. Thank you. Thank you for being here, for taking the time to hopefully prayerfully and genuinely consider um, where our church is and where you are uh, as we seek to address this sin of racism, um, this, this evil that exists in our country and exists in the institutions and systems, including our church. Um, we appreciate your thoughtful consideration of this and invite continued conversation and continued work with you uh, as we move forward together to build up, king, uh, build up God's kingdom here on earth. You'll see behind us contact information for Deacon Royce in the African American Pastoral Ministries Office and for myself in the Catholic Social Action Office. Uh, together we work on an anti-racism task force for the Archdiocese and we are always welcome. Uh, oh, excuse me. We are always interested and willing to work with you in your parish, in your school, in your community, in your neighborhood, to teach, to process, to learn, and to journey together uh, to help end the sin of racism and to be a people who are truly after God's heart and are truly committed to justice and peace for all people. We want to thank you for this sacred time together. This is sacred time, this holy space where God's people enter into a moment seeking direction, seeking insight, but seeking to be empowered by God to do great work. And as we close, we, we, we just want to want to to bless you and ask God to bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God, who calls us to justice, empowers us to be humble and to be workers in the vineyard. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you.